sorry, I was on mute the whole time. Um, yeah, the, the practice session link was the same one, but uh, now I've, I've started the webinar. So we are, uh, we're currently recording and the attendees can start to, uh, to filter in here. So I'll, uh, I'll jump back on in about five minutes or so when we hit one o'clock and we'll, uh, we'll get started. everybody thank you for joining us uh, we're just going to wait a couple more minutes here for a few more attendees to filter in and then we'll get started thanks for being here
All righty, I think we can uh, get the show on the road here just a couple minutes past 1 p.m. Uh, thank you very much, everybody who's here for joining us today. Uh, this is the Canadian Grapevine Certification Networks webinar on tissue culture and crown gall. Uh, my name is Ethan Churchill. I am the project manager for CGC and RCCV. Uh, and today I will serve as your moderator. We are joined by four fabulous guest speakers who I'm uh, really thrilled are joining us today. We have Dr. Robin Brown, Rob Haynes, Dr. Tanya Vogel, and Dr. Judy Monas with us here today. Uh, just a couple of administrative notes before we get started. Uh, first of all, the webinar is being recorded uh, and it'll be posted on our website afterwards if you wish to view it again or uh, share it with anybody who couldn't make it today. Uh, if at any point during the webinar you have a question for one of our panelists, uh, there is a, a Q&A button right near the bottom of your Zoom screen where you can type in your question and it'll appear for, uh, for all of us. We'll do a Q&A session at the end of all four presentations today. Um, so at any point, if you have questions, type it in there uh, and we can address them uh, during our Q&A. Uh, also, I was, uh, it was brought to my attention last webinar that we did uh, that some people were having some issues with the, uh, the size of the screen sharing window. Um, so you are able, when, uh, when a screen is being shared, as, uh, as is the one we have here right now, um, to adjust the size of the screen, if you hover your cursor between the presentation window and the camera where all the panelists are on the right side, you hover over in between there, the cursor should turn into a double arrow, and then you can drag to, uh, to resize the screen accordingly. Um, so if you're having issues perhaps reading the presentation slides, if it's a bit small, you should be able to, uh, to adjust it that way. Uh, so we will dive in in just a couple minutes into the first presentation, uh, but before we do that, I'm going to give just a, a brief presentation for CGCN. Uh, last time we did a general overview of the organization, so today I'm going to go into a bit of a deeper dive into one part of our Grapevine certification program, which is our interim verification program. So just a brief history lesson here for you. Uh, back in June of 2019, more than $2.3 million in funding was announced through the Canadian Agricultural Partnerships Agri-Assurance Program to create a network of certified virus-free grapevines that Canadian grape growers can plant uh, in their vineyards to ensure the long-term viability of the Canadian grape and wine sectors. The funding is allocated to both our long-term certification program and our interim verification program. Uh, the latter of which I'm going to be discussing right now. Uh, so the way this program works, essentially it's a program uh, working with nursery partners to test pre-existing propagation blocks for four primary viruses of concern, which are leaf roll one, leaf roll three, red blotch and Pinot Gris virus. Uh, this is done at a 50-50 cost share between CGCN and the partner nursery uh, until the end of March, 2023. Sample collection and testing is being done uh, by a third party, which is the Covey Virus Testing Lab uh, located at Brock University in St. Catharines, Ontario. We work with both nurseries for general propagation, which is the majority of what's done through this program, uh, but we also work with wineries and grape growers directly who wish to do custom propagation of their own vineyards. So just a bit of an infographic here for you uh, to outline the process. Um, so as I mentioned, testing pre-existing nursery propagation blocks. Uh, the first phase of testing involves a random sample of 10% of the vineyard, uh, which includes a visual inspection and PCR testing. Uh, if 15% or more of the vineyard is found to be infected, uh, it is dropped from the program. But if less than 15% is found to be infected, uh, the propagation block moves into the second phase of testing, which is the middle green square in that top arrow there. The, that second phase of the protocols involves testing each individual vine via a composite sample of leaves from five vines or a two cane or sorry, composite sample of canes from two different vines. Uh, the threshold of virus is 0.1%, which would be one in 1000 vines. Uh, if that composite sample is found to be more than 0.1% infected, uh, the nursery has the option either of testing each vine in that sample individually and removing only the infected ones or to remove all vines in the composite sample. Uh, once the vineyard is tested and confirmed clean under the 0.1% threshold, 
The plants propagated from those vines are deemed verified through CGCN RCCV. Uh, although, all, like all certification programs, no warranty is necessarily given uh, on the final plant. Uh, and in terms of annual maintenance, we have yearly audits done through a 10% random sampling, as well as visual inspections of the vineyards and nursery records. Uh, that all occurs to ensure that no uh, reinfection of the propagation block has occurred. So look for these badges at your favorite Canadian nurseries to see if they are a participant in CGCN's interim verification program. Uh, current participants, the, the badges here are a little outdated, but current participants are Upper Canada Growers, who are uh, represented on our panel here today by Mr. Rob Haynes. We also have Viticulture A&M and the Canadian Fruit Tree Nursery, which is part of Vineland Growers. Uh, you can refer to the interim verification program page of our website to see what varieties are currently available through these nurseries. Uh, testing is completed every year, so the results are updated on a regular basis on our website. Uh, CGCN, as I mentioned, has also opened up this program to growers and wineries directly for custom propagation, which I'll explain uh, very briefly right now. Uh, so the way this works, essentially, uh, it's a three-way agreement between CGCN, one of our partner nurseries and the grower or winery who are looking to have the propagation done. Uh, so there's a contract and approved relationship between the grape grower slash winery and the nursery. Uh, the grower or winery agrees to pay for the testing, collection and mapping of the propagation block uh, with the, the asterisk that it's a 50-50 cost share up until the end of March, 2023. Uh, testing can be done either on leaf or cane samples according to the same uh, code of practice as, as is in place with the verification program. Although samples are tested for the four viruses of concern, as I mentioned, which is leaf roll one, three, red blotch, and Pinot Gris virus. Um, CGCN then also has an audit trail provided, same thing we do through the interim verification program. Uh, so we can audit that the grapevines were propagated and sold directly to the grape grower or winery only. Uh, and the nursery also remits a, a 10 cent vine levy per vine sold to CGCN RCCV through this program. Uh, custom propagation for grape growers and wineries under this program is now available, uh, as I mentioned, 50 50 cost share until the end of March 2023. And this is available on a first come, first served basis. Uh, so if we have any growers or wineries on the call here who are curious about this part of the program specifically, uh, at the end of my presentation here, I have my contact information. So you're welcome to to reach out if you have questions about that. And here's just a quick uh, visual badge for the, uh, the current members of our interim verification program. As I mentioned, of course, we have Upper Canada Growers who are a recent addition to this program. They're also a member of our long-term certification program. Uh, and we also have Canadian Fruit Tree Nursery through Vineland Growers, uh, those two are based in Ontario. We also have uh, Viticulture a and which is based in Quebec. That's all for me. Uh, I appreciate you giving me a few minutes to share a little bit about our programming. Uh, if you have any questions or want to reach out about anything I discussed, my contact information uh, is there and will be listed in follow up emails after the webinar today as well. So I will stop sharing my screen uh, and I will let Robin get his set up. And in the meantime, I will uh, do a brief introduction for him. So Dr. Robin Brown has been involved with plant tissue culture in various capacities over the past 40 years. Currently, he is the propagation specialist for germplasm conservation at the Casey Irving Environmental Science Center and Harriet Irving Botanical Gardens at Acadia University in Nova Scotia. Robin has completed many tissue culture based research projects over the years in the agriculture, horticulture and forestry sectors. Since coming to Acadia University, he's been active with conservation of native species of the Acadian forest region, as well as several crops of interest throughout Nova Scotia. Most recently, his research on crops has centered around the development of tissue culture and cryogenics technologies for applications with grapevines. Without further ado, I will uh, let Robin take it away. Okay, thanks, uh, Ethan, and welcome everyone. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about tissue culture. Um, the purpose of my talk is more in the general sense to um, describe 
basic principles um, and practices of tissue culture. Um, I've got five main topics to cover here. Um, just a basic definition, a brief history, um, regeneration pathways that are involved in tissue culture. Um, I want to address uh, the stages of the process. And just to give you a heads up, that's a, a video that will, will uh, uh, pop on as I proceed to the slides. Lastly, I wanted to talk a bit about applications. Um, I expect that Rob Haynes in the next talk will We'll address that a bit more, but um, I did want to talk a bit about applications as it pertains to uh, research that's going on um, at, at Acadia. And although I will be talking about uh, several plants in the course of this talk, I will come back to um, talk about grapevines periodically as appropriate. So, First of all, its definition, uh, plant tissue culture can be described as the aseptic culture of isolated plant cells, tissues, or organs under defined nutrient media and controlled growth conditions. Um, this the middle, whoops. This uh, middle image here shows a typical culture. There are some uh, culture medium there um, that you can see. So this plant is um, under tissue culture conditions, so to speak. Um, but apart from the uh, what's needed to prepare the, the nutrient medium here, um, typically a, a tissue culture facility will need uh, clean air uh, chambers of some sort in order to do aseptic manipulations, as well as a um, Growth room is shown here where cultures can be maintained and uh, manipulated after the transfer process. <clears throat> as far as history goes, um, we can go back to Gottlieb Haberland, 1902 who uh, first introduced the concept of what's known as plant totipotency. Uh, and basically that is a hypothesis whereby all, and I say living in this case, living plant cells under the appropriate conditions have the capacity uh, to regenerate the entire plant body. This hypothesis became the theoretical framework for subsequent research. Um, so which led into the 1920s and 40s where uh, studies were sought to um, develop the appropriate conditions uh, uh, to allow uh, the inherent developmental capacity of plant cells to regenerate. Um, and that involved a lot of studies on just the basic composition of culture media, nutrients, organic supplements, and eventually uh, discovery of plant growth regulators or PGRs as we call them, um, which are key compounds in terms of triggering developmental responses. And during this period, there were a lot of reports of sustained growth um, for cultured cells, tissues and organs, um, some indication of regeneration, but uh, this kind of work really uh, proliferated in the 50s and 60s uh, particularly with studies involving uh, tobacco and carrot um, as, as model systems. And the image over here, you can see uh, some uh, carrot sections in culture and subsequent regeneration. Uh, during this period, uh, there were a lot of studies on the effects of PGRs um, on regeneration and eventual experimental demonstration of the concept of totipotency, so single cells regenerating into entire plants. Um, 1970s to present, um, there were proliferation of reports on regenerations of shoots, roots, and embryos from various plants um, and subsequent uh, applications of methodologies developed uh, during that time. Um, 
Now to talk a bit about regeneration pathways. What do I mean by pathways? Basically, there are organogenic pathways, organogenesis, which is essentially the formation of shoots or roots, uh, or em embryogenesis, which is the formation, the direct formation of, of embryos. I have some examples up here in this top panel of photographs. Here we see our root regeneration from, from a rose uh, material and culture. There's clusters of shoots from a flax culture. There are even uh, embryos here from grapevine. And this culture here may not be that clear to see. Um, now, the, all these pathways can be uh, induced directly or indirectly. And um, by directly, I mean from pre-existing differentiated cells of plants or indirectly by what I refer to as, as callus. Um, and callus is generally described as a, a mass of unorganized plant cells, often um, develop as a wound response, can be further um, induced to proliferate through PGRs and other uh, conditions. So here's an example on a white ash explant, if you say in culture, um, and oftentimes what you can get is uh, regeneration from these unorganized cells, callus cells. So down here below, I have an image of some rose callus in culture. And if we do a microscopic analysis, here we can see some um, embryogenic structures appearing um, in the callus, uh, eventually maturing into embryos we see here. Um, which can be matured, germinated, and grown as plants, uh, much the same way you would um, seed-born embryos. So these would be uh, ase asexual uh, culture-born embryos. Another important consideration when uh, we're talking about regeneration through tissue culture are meristems. Whatever root, direct or indirect, um, Meristems uh, need to be there. Um, so they can be pre-existing meristems, that is meristems that are, are part of the plant body, uh, or they can be de novo, or what's referred to as adventitious. So they can either be induced or encouraged to develop um, from pre-existing positions. I just want to follow up on the pre-existing uh, meristems. Uh, the reason why I want to do this is because um, this is a typical strategy for tissue culture-based regeneration from woody plants. Um, so pre-existing meristems would be your shoot or your root uh, meristems. I'm referring to um, the shoots at this point, whoops. So here we have an image of a white ash uh, shoot sort of laterally and from above. Um, if you were to peel back these leaves from the shoot, um, you'd end up with the smaller shoots um, that surround what is referred to here as the, as the shoot meristem. So, this structure here is referred to as the shoot tip, so the smaller uh, leaves surrounding that growth center. Um, and if you were to continue to peel those back, you'd eventually come to an exposed shoot meristem, um, which is the organizational center for formation of the entire uh, shoot of the plant. Um, now, the interesting thing is, of course, that um, both the terminal buds and the all the lateral side buds of every shoot will contain these shoot meristems. So it gives us an opportunity to um, exploit those meristems, encourage them to develop in culture, and give us an avenue by which we can propagate plants. So as I said, this is uh, a typical strategy used for propagation of uh, woody species, um, grapevines included. I'm gonna jump into the process now, the stages. So 
Um, next slide, you'll see uh, a video of the process as we would typically do at the Irving Center. KC Irving Environmental Science Center and Harriet Irving Botanical Gardens support environmental research and Acadian forest region conservation. This video involves participants demonstrating the stages of the tissue culture process. These are undergraduate students or recent graduates of Acadia University. The university encourages hands-on research activities part of the student's educational experience. Willow test material is being shown as the example, but the general stages would also apply to grapevines. An essential requirement for tissue culture is to have defined nutrient media available to establish and maintain cultures, as well as usually to induce regeneration from isolated cells, tissues, or organs. The nutrient media components will vary, but the general preparation steps are similar. The various components are weighed, mixed, and dissolved. Then the pH is adjusted. The media solutions are sterilized, most commonly with an autoclave, which heats the solutions under pressure to kill any potentially contaminating microbes. The media is then removed from the autoclave and taken to a clean air bench for pouring under aseptic conditions, then left to solidify. The first step in the culturing process is generally referred to as the initiation stage. Samples are collected from source material in the greenhouse or field. In this case, we are collecting shoots from willows grown in a controlled greenhouse environment. They are placed in label bags and taken to the tissue culture lab for processing. Samples are cut into sections and placed in containers for surface sterilization. Typically, the containers are placed in a series of detergent, alcohol, and bleach treatments to clean the samples. Next step is to trim the samples further to provide explants, as we call them, and place the explants on an initiation culture medium. This medium contains an antimicrobial agent to help control any contamination which may overgrow the explants. Initiated cultures are checked regularly over a two to six week period for any signs of contamination or growth. Non-responsive or contaminated cultures are removed from the population and the remaining material is transferred to fresh medium, usually of a different composition, to establish a stable starting population of clean growing cultures. This transition period is termed the stabilization stage. After sufficient growth of stabilized cultures has been achieved, usually in two to three months, the multiplication stage can begin, whereby sections of the original cultures are subdivided regularly and recultured. The process can continue indefinitely to build up large populations, which can be done year round in a controlled lab facility. Repeated transfer cycles can yield very large numbers of plants if desired. In this example with willow, four progeny cultures were produced from the one original culture. If this level of multiplication can be sustained consistently from a starting stabilized culture population of 10, then a resulting population of over 40,000 could be achieved in six months. In several labs around the world, millions of plants are produced this way every year. Once a sufficient culture population has been multiplied, it is then possible to reintroduce these plants back to a greenhouse or field environment. This stage is called oat planting. Shoots or plantlets, depending on whether roots have formed at this point or not, are removed from culture, cleaned of residual culture medium, and placed in a suitable growing substrate, which is usually a peat perlite mix to be maintained under high humidity for a two to three week acclimatization period. This is a critical step for the process to ensure the sensitive plants from culture make the proper adjustment to the harsher greenhouse and field conditions without significant losses. Casey. Okay, I hope that gave you a, an idea of the general stages. Um, 
now I wanted to just touch on um, three applications, particularly as they pertain to some of the research activity that's going on at Acadia. Um, <clears throat> so that would be conservation. By conservation, I mean the establishment of a germplasm bank in culture, micropropagation, which would involve the mass production of, of plants, and path is pathogen control, where we're looking to uh, develop clean planting stock. On the conservation side, um, at Acadia, we do a lot of work with conservation of native species uh, using tissue culture, particularly when that species is at risk. So what usually happens is we'll have seeds collected um, and withdrawn from our seed bank, which we have on site. We would germinate those seeds um, in culture and then eventually establish uh, stock uh, culture populations of that material. It's a very useful strategy when plants are at risk. Um, there's a limited amount of seed supply um, and very useful for subsequent research that we do on campus. Um, this strategy is quite commonly used um, by conservation labs around the world. One in particular would be uh, Kew Gardens um, in the UK. It can also be used for conservation of clonal crops, such as grapevine, <coughs> excuse me. But in this case, of course, we're concerned with uh, maintaining uh, clonal integrity. So the starting material would be shoot material from vineyards. So we collect shoots, establish them in culture, maintain the lines in culture. So we've been successful with our program uh, establishing more than 40 cultivars in culture, including hybrids and vinifera lines, as well as 10 rootstock. Uh, another aspect is conservation through cryopreservation, um, which also has a tissue culture component to it. So typically what happens, you'll have culture material as samples that go through a, a, a processing series. Um, they're frozen in liquid nitrogen, usually in cryo tubes, um, and kept in, in cryo tanks as such. Um, this is a strategy for long-term storage. It, it's a secure method, relatively low cost. We've been working quite extensively with the New Zealand Plant and Food Research Institute on this aspect. Um, they are looking at uh, cryobanks for, for many types of plants. Uh, in particular, they've been developing a bank for potato. And as I understand it, they have at least 170 cultivars now in their cryobank. Um, of course, we've been looking at the potential of developing a cryobank for grapevine. Um, so that has been the major part of our collaboration with them. <clears throat> Another aspect would be micropropagation, as I've mentioned before, for uh, mass production. And using grapevine as an example, is basically as I described in, in the video, starting material, which would be rooted cuttings, in this case, going through an initiation stage in culture, stabilizing material in culture, and then transitioning into a multiplication stage and typically with the lines that we've tested uh, for grapevine, we're looking at a five times multiplication rate every four to six week uh, culture cycle, which is fairly high. Um, we move into bulk cultures and then to, to oak planting. So we've tested uh, many cultivars this way, um, found it to be a quite effective uh, method We've had to vary some of the culture media depending on the <coughs> material. We've had to adjust some of the oak planting procedures, but in general, we're looking at about an 80% survival rate um, among the cultures that are oak planted. Uh, the last application I wanted to address is pathogen control and particularly uh, cryotherapy, which is a relatively novel approach to eradicating viruses in grapevine. 
and I won't read all the uh, captions here. Basically what this approach boils down to is having a shoe tip in culture. Um, the red cells here in this diagram uh, represent infected cells, which tend to localize in the more differentiated cells of the shoe tip. These green cells um, would be the un uninfected cells. Uh, <clears throat> we basically go through a pre-culture period with material transitions into a short-term uh, treatment with liquid nitrogen. So in contrast to the long-term storage aspect in cryopreservation, this is a relatively short exposure, which essentially kills the cells that are, preferentially kills the cells that are infected in the shoot tip. So here we have a shoot tip coming through the cryotherapy process. It is recovered as shown down here. Um, regrown and then tested for presence or absence uh, of the virus. So here we have a post cryo shoot tip. Um, the yellow cells represent the killed cells of the sample. Green cells are remaining viable and these are the cells that will regenerate um, the plant material. So in theory, um, this liquid nitrogen treatment eradicates, preferentially eradicates the virus infected cells. So that's all I wanted to touch on today. I know that's rather brief, but that gives you an idea of the tissue culture process and some of the applications, at least as related to activity at Acadia. Um, we have several collaborators, um, specifically on the grapevine research. Um, Ranjith Patharina from the New Zealand Plant and Food Research Institute. Um, Arison Wright, Shakat Ali from Egg Canada Kentville Station, Matthew Van Koknet from NSCC, and Gail Folk from USDA. So we've been involved with all of these people in various aspects as related to tissue culture and cryogenics at Acadia. And I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention and acknowledge uh, the many, many students who have been involved with us at Acadia um, in various tissue culture related uh, projects over the past seven years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robin. That was uh, very, very interesting and informative. Uh, brief certainly, but you covered a lot in a short period of time. So uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, uh, I'll let Rob get his material set up. And uh, in the meantime, I'll introduce him. Uh, just a reminder as well to everybody that's uh, watching the webinar right now, feel free to type any questions you have at any point into the, the Q&A section of the, uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen right in the middle there. And we'll address all the questions uh, at the end. So Rob, are you, uh, are you with us? Yep, I'm just setting up the video that we have to run. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll go through your introduction right now and give you a few minutes here. Okay. So as president of Upper Canada Growers, Rob Haynes' experience as a lifelong farmer and former general manager of Maury Essex Nurseries has made him an expert in change management and building alliances within the agriculture industry. Rob comes from a multi-generational family farm who originally moved to Jordan, Ontario in 1784 and have spent over 230 years primarily farming fruit, flowers, and grapes. Mr. Haynes is a respected member of the agricultural community in Ontario and is a founding member of the National Fruit Tree Initiative Steering Committee and an advisor to the board for the Ontario Hazelnut Committee. He has established strong alliances with researchers at the University of Guelph for the development of micropropagation and micrografting projects and the addition of the Hopetown Plant Lab which aims to expedite the process of producing disease-free tissue culture plants. Rob Haynes, everybody. I'm just trying to get my video up and running. There. Just right there, see it. There it is. It's up. Okay. 
thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be able to speak today. Um, yeah, I, I am a lifetime farmer. That's all I've ever done. It's been a farmer. I started as soon as I could walk as most farmers growing up on a farm did. Um, six years ago, we started into the business of the nursery um, with my son and my daughter. Um, it was, a, it was a change from what we're used to doing, but it, it, it's been a good change. Three years ago, we purchased Maury Nursery's fruit tree division out from them, which quickly propelled Upper Canada into the largest uh, fruit tree nursery in the country. Now, tissue culture. Tissue culture is kind of a long story how we got into it. 10 years ago, um, there were some difficulties with apples. There's a lot of viruses in apples, a lot of fire blight problems. And I was at a conference in the US and there was a Cornell University had developed a fair amount of rootstocks, um, Geneva rootstocks for apples. And the app, these app rootstocks were very good um, for viruses that they, they um, were resistant to most viruses. They were resistant to fire blight. They also became very specific in the crops. They, um, what they did to the apples, like they made some apples larger, some apples redder. They were specific to the climate they were in. They were specific to the soils they were in. So that was a totally new division in, in apples. It really promote, um, promoted apples in a whole nother direction. The problem was we couldn't get the rootstocks. They were very difficult to propagate in the traditional way with stool beds. It was a very slow process. So we turned to tissue culture. The, the tissue culture was the only option. The only place we could get it was in the US. That option was expensive, was hard to find, hard to get. So at the same time, you know, the Guelph had approached us about working together and helping to promote what we were doing and seeing what kind of research they could do. So we talked about tissue culture and they actually said that they could easily do this for us. So we started on a program probably about 10 to eight to 10 years ago in developing tissue culture. It's something that was a very slow process. It didn't happen overnight. Um, a lot of setbacks, a lot of um, work to get it to that point. Um, I can say now we've actually, can, we say we can arrive, we've arrived at it. This year, we're hoping to produce over 2 million plants out of the lab for apples, um, hazelnuts and plums apples being by far the largest part of our production. Now, we have grapevines in production. They're, they've started. Um, I'm not going to give you any, any timelines on that. Um, they seem a lot easier than what apples were. Apples were very difficult. We approached um, CGCN, um, I could guess about two years ago, telling them, explaining our process and what we could do. And the process is really quite easy. It, it's, it, it seems quite easy when I explain it to you. Um, CGN sent some product to CFIA and had it cleaned up. The product is, is in virus indexed for what they're looking for. So we know, we know we're starting with a clean product. <laughs> the, the cuttings were then sent to University of Guelph. The University of Guelph set up all of the protocols for us. And when I'm saying protocols, it set up how we actually initiate this, what kind of mediums we need, what we need in the mediums to promote growth, to promote rooting. So that's all was set up for us. The, um, once that is set up, they then transfer the product to us here at the, at the nursery in our lab. And then we have to make it a commercial um, product. Um, the university can give us the protocols, we have to adjust it to our system and to how our system works here and to make it commercial. Um, universities aren't always on a commercial basis to understand that part of it. <laughs> but we find ourselves right now with product in the lab, it's multiplying well. Um, the product starts in the lab. It then, once it, it's rooted, and up to a certain size in the lab, we transfer it to the greenhouse. This is probably the most difficult part of the transfer from that jar in the, in the lab to actually putting it in the greenhouse. It goes into misting tents, um, as you were told by the previous speaker, the humidity is kept very, uh, very high, but we're constantly fighting with botrytis at that point and um, keeping it too moist, too dry, sunlight. It, it is a diff that's, that's where we lose most of our plants. We generally have been running 
in the 90% success rate at that point. So that's been actually really good. Now with apples, we learned how to micrograft. Micrographing isn't something that's so new in the industry, it's been there, but we developed um, a lot of hormones with the university um, to, to heal that grafting. So the apples have actually been extremely successful micrografting. We've been able to graft apples that you can't even see where the graft is. So it's becoming difficult trying to explain to some farmers we actually grafted it. But we're now transferring that same technology into grapevines and being able to um, micrograft the grapevines in the same way. Then from that point, they've grown the greenhouse up to a, a substantial size. We transfer them into the field. We don't plant them. We put them into, it's a root smart um, alley pot. The pot is, it's about this big around. It's about this deep. The roots, the roots go out to the edge of the pot. They're air pruned off. And the, this pot will go into the field into a screened in area. It won't be planted in the soil. It will be screened in from all the insects in the environment. So this, pro this product will be grown as clean as we possibly can to ensure that the viruses are not spread. So we're starting with a clean product. It's going into a greenhouse, which is screened in. Um, there will be even air um, showers as you enter the greenhouse so you, no one can bring in insects or any other viruses. And then from there, it will go to the field to a screened in area. And then as it develops through the summer, it'll be um, go dormant in the fall and then be put into a cold storage unit here. So the difference is it won't be totally bare root that the farmers are used to seeing. It'll be into a small um, container full of a peat um, perlite mix, but the roots will actually be much farther developed. One of the things we discovered with apples, and this is something Cornell um, university was not thrilled with us at first. When we started using tissue culture to grow apple trees right from the start to end, they were concerned that the tissue culture was slightly juvenile, which it is. It is, there's no question for the first two years, tissue culture is juvenile. So they were against the idea. They did, they have been testing it for the last 10 years and they came back and said, you were right, it actually works well. They're finding in the first five years, the apple tree goes into production much faster than a normally grown apple tree. By the 10th year, the production evens out. But as you know, as farmers, we need that production as quickly as possible to make a, make a field um, economically viable. So between having that soil base, being able to plant that into the ground that the tree doesn't, doesn't have as much difficulty climatizing to that transplant into the farmer's field and the tissue culture being juvenile, you're getting a much superior product. It's a lot different than you're used to, I, I granted, but it, it's actually can outperform anything that you're normally used to seeing. Um, I have to give credit to um, IRAP. IRAP is the, um, the federal government's um, program where they um, support innovation in the country. They have been extremely supportive in this whole process. Um, they point us in the right directions. They point us with connections to the industry and where we should be going forward. Um, and with the University of Wells help, it's been an amazing uh, partnership. <laughs> with, with this whole thing, we started with apples, we started into hazelnuts. Now we're seeing that the whole industry um, in the fruit industry is approaching us. We've been approached by the strawberry industry. We've just signed contracts to grow tissue culture for the strawberries. We're looking at asparagus, raspberries, and garlic also. The industry is changing drastically. The climate's warming. We, we can all feel it and see it. And we're, we're all being faced with viruses we've never been faced with before. And, and that's becoming difficult and hard to work with. The methods we're bringing to the table are helping to mitigate with the viruses. Yes, there's viruses. There's viruses that are good. There's viruses that are bad. And it's we need to isolate the viruses that we don't want and then eliminate them and be able to produce a product that's good for the market. The, the University of Guelph and the um, Ontario Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association's plan is 
to turn Upper Canada into the Clean Plant Centre for Canada. They want us to be able to cryo-freeze the plants here, to be able to store plants in our facility for the future. Um, so that's, that's the goal and the government supporting the whole process in the, in the meantime. We're discovering too, as we're going along, is that when I was a kid, my parents put on nitrogen and pot, um, potash. That's what they used. If plants didn't grow, we just put more nitrogen on, we put more potash on, that's, that's how it worked. We put manure on the fields. We discovered in the last few years, we were ignoring all the microbes in the soils. So we started into actually testing. Um, we test the soil before we plant. We test the um, growth of the, of the, leaf, the leaves of the plant. And then we test the bark of the plant. And then we adjust the micronutrients in the system. But we missed a whole nother part. It's, it's the, um, the micro um, in the root systems. And that's what we, that, that bio microbes in the new system, we've gone back and we started to look at that. So now we're doing a research project with the federal government to look at that whole issue with the root system. If you look at a, a, a forest, the forest actually can manage droughts much better than our trees can. They manage pests much better. They manage climate changes much better because they have that, that bio microbes in the, in the root system. We've ignored that. So now we're going back and looking at that too to try to increase the strength of the plant. And this is, um, we got a grant from the federal government. We have a research lab that's actually looking at this too. So we're trying to produce a plant that can actually withstand a lot more conditions and thus helping the farmer reduce some of his fertilizer use and some of his um, chemicals, uh, chemicals, pesticides and, um, on the plant. So helping to increase the environment and helping to support the plant to grow larger. I worked in this industry my whole life. I started picking cherries when I could walk. Um, I picked grapes when I could only reach the bottom wire of the, grape, of the grapes to pick them. And I was taught how to prune by an old man that taught me to learn to, how to feel a plant and to prune it accordingly. And that's what we need to do. We need to see and understand where the plant is at and understand it's unfortunate we didn't start with the roots in the beginning and work back through the system. We started with nitrogen and worked the opposite way, unfortunately. But now we have to understand that, that things can change. Um, I had a biology teacher that told me once, I would forget everything in six months that he taught me. And I thought, well, that's stupid what am I in this course for? He was correct. I forgot most everything he taught me. He said to me, he said, if I can teach you one thing is how to learn. And that's, that's one thing that stuck with me. And that's something that we have to continue to learn the rest of our lives and understand that the, the game is changing. If I ever showed my grandparents the lab that you guys are seeing running there, they would have been stunned and think that, that we'd gone crazy. But Farming is changing. We have to make a profit and we have to make the plants stronger than where they're used to. We've been doing the same thing for hundreds of years, using the same soil for hundreds of years. We need to change the game because it's not working as well as it used to be. The plants aren't as strong. Aren't as strong. You know, in apples in particular, apples were, were come from Northern India, Afghanistan, that area. A thousand years ago, we've been breeding these, these products for years and we bred all of the good stuff out of them. And now we have to go back to that root system and put that bio microbes back into that root system and get the plant back stronger. With having tissue culture, we're able to do that. We're able to pick out the viruses that we want out of the plant. We're able to put in things that we need into the root system that need to be there and come up with a better plant for all of us. And we've seen it with apples. We, we have been able to produce a much better plant. We're in, we're in the process of planting apple orchards and all I want is tissue culture in those orchards because the plant is stronger and better. I know great farmers aren't used to it, but it, it's something that, you know, it, it, we'll see and you'll see the difference. Thank you. I know it was short, but anyway, that's the, the crux of the... Thank you very much, Rob. That was uh, that was fascinating. I think it's 
certainly a first here for our webinars to have two different video presentations in the same session. So we're, uh, we're trailblazing a bit here today. And I think it's really interesting to, uh, to see firsthand the work that's being done uh, both in the lab at Acadia and, uh, and with you at Upper Canada Growers. So, so thank you very much. Um, yeah, you can go ahead and uh, stop sharing your screen there. Yeah, and no worries, you're all good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Is that good? Yes, I still see your desktop. Um, yeah, if, uh, on the desktop screen, there should oh, be a little. There, I got it. Stop it. There you go. That's perfect. Thanks, Rob. Uh, all right, we're going to switch gears now. Uh, we've talked about tissue culture for the first half of the webinar. Now we're going to move on to crown gall. Um, so I will let uh, Dr. Judy Monis get her presentation set up and get her camera going. Uh, but in the meantime, I will go through uh, her brief biography here. So Dr. Judy Monis is currently a plant pathology consultant at Vineyard and Plant Health Consulting. Based in the California Central Coast, she globally advises clients on diverse pathology issues in fruit, horticultural, and ornamental crops. She has previously held positions with a number of organizations, including Agritope Inc., Seminus Vegetable Seeds, USDA, Eurofins, and Ball Horticultural Co. Judith holds a doctorate in plant pathology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and received postdoctoral training at the University of California at Berkeley. Judith, go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your introduction and inviting me to be here today. Um, I am going to be giving a brief presentation on grapevine crown gall, um, just an overview and prevention. And um, this is an outline of the presentation. I will start talking and showing you some symptoms and describe the disease, um, present a little bit of information on disease management and prevention. Um, what is required for plant when you're planting a new vineyard? Uh, what are the testing requirements? And talk a little bit about statistical sampling. Um, quite a bit for a very short show. So thanks, thanks again for listening. Um, here are some symptoms of crown gall um, disease. And basically the name of the disease is you expect to have um, the galls um, on the crown uh, or bottom part of the plant, but that is not always the case. Oftentimes you can also see um, galls in the aerial um, part of the plant. And that um, is something that we will see sometimes in nursery propagated material, but also we will see it in the field, uh, depending of course in the, in the climatic conditions, maybe um, not so in, in Northern, um, Canada, but, um, but we do see quite often these symptoms in California. Um, grapevine crown gall um, disease is caused by Agrobacterium vitis. Um, the bacterium can be found in the soil epithetically and in the rhizoplane. Vines could be infected systemically for a long period of time without showing any symptoms. That is the danger of perhaps purchasing asymptomatic vines from uh, a nursery. Um, and later on, they actually could show symptoms um, or even intensify the symptoms due to frost or uh, mechanical injury, injuries. Um, just to um, talk a little bit about disease management um, and prevention. Um, and prevention is really important because um, these disease, this disease does not have any cure, you cannot cure it. At the nursery, it's really important um, to apply statistical testing to discard infected lots. And that's very important to do it at the beginning, uh, just testing coming material prior to propagation, um, just to make sure that you're not making too many plants um, that are actually diseased. Uh, sampling plants should be uh, present in the nursery to assure that vines are pathogen free. And when I mention this, um, uh, my field is pathology. So I also think it's really important at the same time that you're testing for agrobacterium to be testing for other pathogens such as viruses and fungi. And also the nursery must have a sanitation plan. And this is, um, should include the cold storage and graft grafting benches, cutting tools for displaying and grafting, the callusing media, 
in the water bath. At the vineyard, of course, uh, the most important thing would be to plant agrobacterium free plants. And obviously these would be tested. Um, avoid plants, um, planting vines that have been propagated from mothers that grown in an agrobacterium infected area. Avoid top grafting with no knowledge of the disease status because you could actually be introducing um, a disease and actually the grafting it per se is already an injury. So if the vine was infected prior without showing symptoms, it might actually develop symptoms later. Uh, make sure you're scouting your vineyard to be able to see um, any symptoms. Remove and replace disease vines. Um, the bacteria, however, can remain in the soil. Use drip irrigation. And in cold climate, it's also a nice strategy to train the vines uh, with two trunks. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, this disease has no cure. And here I have actually pictures that I've taken in, in a vineyard in Pennsylvania in which um, the vineyard has been trained with two trunks. And this two trunk vine training is also um, good um, if you actually worry about other trunk diseases caused by uh, fungi in cold climates. Um, when you're planting a new vineyard, um, it is really important to, to again, uh, test um, the vines for different diseases uh, or, or pathogens. But um, it, this slide actually shows um, bench grafts that are coming straight from a nursery. And my suggestion generally is if you see something like this, I wouldn't even test it. I would probably discard them because, um, or not purchase from this nursery because um, if you have vines that look like this, they really are not uh, gonna do much better when they're planted in the vineyard. Actually, I've been asked that question if, if plants will get better. And, and the answer is no, they will not get better. Um, there is actually cyan and rootstock uh, different sensi sensitivities. Um, most of the wine grape um, cyan material is susceptible. Um, there are some um, hybrid varieties and American vines um, uh, uh, species that are actually resistant, um, but the susceptibility and resistance may vary also depending on the avitis strains, agrobacterium strains. And for rootstocks also, there is um, more susceptible, more, um, some rootstocks are more sus susceptible than others. And so maybe this is something good to take into consideration, specifically if you are growing vines in cold climate. When you're planting a new vineyard, um, there is certain testing that's required um, prior to um, the planting. Um, in a sampling, it's very important, both rootstock and cyan material. And this is either if the material is certified or not. Um, sampling of, of a previous vineyard, um, if you are replanting or top grafting, because um, the previous vineyard could have been infected with pathogen, specifically agrobacterium, which may remain in the soil. So it's very important to know what was in the vineyard before you actually are planting a new vineyard, especially because you're spending a lot of money testing. Um, test for virus, bacteria, and fungal pathogens. And soil testing is really important also if you um, removed a diseased vineyard. Um, there are questions that you must ask the nursery. Um, when, for example, when was the increased block planted, uh, the longer the, and older the increased block is, the likelihood that it could become diseased. Um, is, are these signs certified? Does the nursery have a disease testing and sanitation plan? How many vines and how often are these tested for which pathogens? And if they do have a testing uh, program, then request an analytical report so that you can learn um, the testing schedule and its history. Uh, there are common mistakes that people make when they're planting a vineyard. And I can tell you that after so many years of working in this industry, I probably can think that I've seen it all. Um, some people are planting healthy looking vines from the neighbor's vineyard um, when they're not so uh, healthy. Uh, planting pathogen tested plant, uh, planting material where um, an infected vineyard was removed. Um, top grafting a vineyard with poor performance without knowing the cause, removing part of the disease vineyard to avoid stopping production. 
Um, in the left, you can actually see um, 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 a vine from a vineyard that was top grafted. Um, and initially, um, probably um, the vineyard um, was um, changed because um, of a variety. They wanted to change variety, say that they had a, a Malbec and then they wanted actually to go to Chardonnay or so forth. And um, and this um, and then um, obviously they did not have any uh, Crongal before because obviously I cannot imagine that they would have um, top grafted a vineyard that was diseased. But of course I was called to the vineyard after the fact and found that 100% of the vines in the vineyard had these symptoms. And so it's really important before um, you want you decide to top graft the vineyard or um, plan on replanting to make sure that if there's a problem in the vineyard, you figure out what the problem is before um, you proceed to um, replanting or um, top grafting because the consequences are very expensive after the fact. Um, every disease testing project um, has um, several factors. Um, the sample number um, generally will depend on the knowledge of the vineyard history, for example, do we know um, that we can trace the mothers? Um, uh, what is the general health status? Um, which, how many rootstocks, how many, um, what other stresses might be uh, present? But um, in my long history of working with vineyards and nurseries, the most important factor is the available budget. Um, sample size will vary. In a highly infected vineyard, a few samples will suffice. But um, if you have a healthy vineyard and you have uh, very many samples, many, many plants, many samples will be required. And this is why um, sometimes we work with statistics, uh, especially when there are no symptoms in a vineyard. Um, and no symptoms does not mean free, freedom of disease. No symptoms mean that the conditions were not such for the disease to develop, but it's very possible that any of these vines could be diseased or infected. Um, so I have developed a method in which um, we um, can um, apply statistical sample. And to apply statistical sample, you actually have to assume a certain percentage of infection. And depending on the percentage of infection, you will see based on these tables, and I will actually probably go pretty quickly, but you will have a chance to see these, um, uh, these um, slides later on. So you'll be able to actually take a look at this and, and, and get more information. But based on the um, number of vines that you have in a blog and um, the, um, the disease incidence that you expect, um, there is a number of samples you need to test. And of course, if you um, have a certain number of samples and after 100,000 samples, we, it's the same as if you had infinite. So, so there's basically about 300 samples that you would have to take if you wanna have a 95% confidence statistically. Um, but you'll see how this number will change if you assume or actually have a visual inspection in the vineyard and you think that there's a 5% infection then you definitely have to test much less to be able to find at least one infected vine. And of course, if you assume a 50% infection, then you actually need to test much less. So it's, again, it's really important to have an idea of what the infection rate is and what your tolerance of um, confidence is um, when you do statistical analysis. Um, to conclude, um, I would like to, um, say that um, it's very important to start with clean, and when I mean clean, it's disease-tested planting material. It's important to develop a sanitation and disease testing plan at the nursery and vineyard, monitor frequently vineyard blocks, and maintain a good communication with nursery personnel. Thank you so much for um, listening, and, um, and this is my contact information. If you have any more questions, I know that we are holding off um, for the questions at the end of the seminar. So I will um, uh, conclude my presentation right here. Thank you. That's perfect, Judy. Thank you so much. I appreciate you uh, being here with us. Thank you.
All righty. And last but not least, I will uh, let Dr. Vogel get her slides up and I will go through her introduction here. So Dr. Tanya Vogel completed her undergraduate and graduate studies at the University of Freiburg, Germany, where she graduated in 2003 with an MSc degree in cell biology and microbiology. In 2004, she moved to Davis, California to, do, to work with Dr. Walter D. Gubler on grapevine powdery mildew and trunk diseases. In 2006, Tanya started a doctoral program with the University of Freiburg and UC Davis, California to study Zoella fastidiosa, the causal agent of Pierce's disease of grapevines. In 2011, Dr. Vogel started a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of British Columbia, Okanagan with Dr. Louise Nelson. Currently, Dr. Vogel is a research associate at the University of British Columbia Okanagan campus. Her work focuses on Agrobacterium vitis, the causal agent of grapevine crown gall. She has developed a methodology for quantification of the pathogen in grapevine nursery stock and vineyard soil, and is interested in biological control of crown gall. Tanya, thank you very much for being here and I'll turn it over to you. Hey, thank you for the introduction, Ethan, and thank you to Judith for the, the good background about um, crown gall. So that allows me to jump right into our um, research activities that we have been doing. Um, before I do that, though, I would like to play a little game with everyone. Um, on this slide here, you see um, crown gall symptoms. However, one of those pictures is not um, a crown gall symptom. So if, if you all want to have a look, and let me know which photo is not crown gall by just typing the number in the um, question and answer section. So I don't see anything yet. Anybody just guessing something? We have five and 11. That's not right. So it is actually number three. So number three is um, callousing that has happened um, during the nursery process. Um, photos one, two, and four are goals that develop in the graft union and the trunk. Number five are goals that have developed all the way up the cane. Um, six are symptoms, how I see them when I inoculate grapevines in the greenhouse. And we have seven and eight. Those are goals in uh, nursing material. And then photo nine shows symptoms in a vineyard. So the left vine is a healthy one and the right one is heavily infected with crown gall. And you see the, the gall at the base of the um, rootstock here. And this um, uh, gall reduces the water flow to the, to the canopy and you see this reduced growth and crown gall symptoms. Um, the vineyard in number 10 has to be completely replaced because of crown gall. And 11 is very important because that is root necrosis that's caused by um, avitis. Um, and this root necrosis can allow other pathogens that you can find in the soil, like fungal pathogens, for example, to enter uh, in the vine as well. Okay, my slides don't move. No. These are the objectives um, of our research activities. And in the interest of time, I'm only going to talk about uh, um, three objectives today. And those are the ones that are highlighted here in bold. Um, the first one is testing of dormant grapevine nursery stock, because there are two ways of um, entry into vineyards. The first one would be if healthy planting material is planted in soil that's already contaminated with avitis. And the second one is if the nursing material already comes infected. Um, the second objective was to isolate some uh, or identify biocontrols that can control avitis. And then in objective five, we've looked at um, if compost applications into the vineyard can suppress um, crown gall. I'm jumping in right into objective one, which was looking at the nursery stock. 
So like Judith said, testing is very important. And that is because sometimes um, nursing material can be infected with crown gall, but because the location of the nursery is maybe in a warmer climate, um, symptoms never appear. So if some cold climate um, regions purchase um, roots, uh, nursing material and it is planted, the plants may experience freeze injury and symptoms um, occur. So testing is important to have an idea of the health status of the nursery material before it goes into the ground here. And there's also no um, grapevine crown gold certification program. So that is different from viruses, for example, where we do have certification programs, but we have nothing like this yet for crown gold. And it is something that is going to be very difficult to achieve. And, and why that is will um, probably become clear when we look at some of the data that I'm going to be showing a bit later. To test the materials, we have developed this DDPCR methodology. And I'm not going to go into any details here right now. But if you're interested, then you can look up the publication that is listed here on this slide. So we have obtained um, grapevines from four different nurseries. And I'm going to label them here as B, C, D, and E. And from each of the nurseries, we've obtained three cultivars. There was Chardonnay, Merlot, and Pinot Noir. And each cultivar we've received between 10 and 15 plants. So for each of those plants, we've taken samples at the roots, the base, the graft union, and the cyan. And DNA was isolated from all of those sampling locations by M. Jose Ubus Torres from the Summerland Research and Development Center. We've then taken these um, DNA samples and used them in our DDPCR assay to determine how much evitis we find in those samples. And these are the results. And I apologize for putting all of those four graphs onto one um, slide, but I would like you to um, compare the, the, the uh, different nurseries to each other. So the numbers on the axis um, show the number of the bacteria that, that we can find. And each bar represents the 10 or 15 um, samples that, that we have looked at. And in green, you can see Chardonnay, blue is represented, uh, uh, represents Merlot, and then red stands for Pinot Noir. Now, if we just look at nursery B and C, it does look like that there is an increase in avitis with an increased location on the vine. So it looks like there is less bacteria in the roots, but there are more bacteria in the cyan. That also holds up if we look, for example, at nursery D in the Pinot Noir, but it's not like that in any of the other nurseries or any of the other cultivars. Um, also in nursery B and C, it looks like Chardonnay has the highest numbers, but nursery D and uh, E show that Merlot and Pinot Noir have, have um, higher number than the Chardonnay. So there is no correlation between um, cultivar and avitis abundance. There are differences between nurseries though. So if we look at nursery C, the highest number here is 15 compared to nursery D where we have the highest numbers at around 450. So there are differences overall between nurseries. And you may also wonder about those huge arrow bars that we see here. This represents the variability between the samples. So those 10 or 15 samples, Sometimes um, we had zero bacteria in those, but in some others, there were a lot of samples. So that increases the variability. In a summary, we found that 74% of all of the samples that we tested had some level of avitis infection. And only one dormant uh, nursery stock that we looked at tested zero at all locations. So it was zero for roots, uh, the base, the graft union, and the cyan. There is no clear pattern between um, the cultivar or the location, and the bacteria are unevenly distributed. The implications for that are um, in regarding testing. So when we test those uh, vines before planting, we can only look at the roots. Um, however, if there are very little bacteria in the roots, that doesn't mean that there are no bacteria in any other locations of the plants. And this is why I think it's going to be difficult to develop a great brand certification program to certify for crown gold free um, vines. So I'm moving into my next objective, which was the evaluation of um, biocontrols. 
Um, biocontrol is a method to control pests and plant diseases by using other organisms, and that's mostly due to the use of the natural enemy um, of the plant pests. So they compete, for example, for nutrients or secrete antibiotics. Um, biocontrol also eliminates the use of pesticides and chemicals and is therefore like a very sustainable solution. There is one very good example of crown gall of stone fruit trees, and this disease is caused by Agrobacterium tumefaciens. This bacterium is closely related to Avitis, um, but it is different. Since many years, there have been strains, uh, biocontrol um, strains developed, and they are called K84, and there's also a derivative of K84 that's called K1026. And both strains produce an antibiotic that essentially kills Agrobacterium tumefaciens. So those strains have been successfully developed into products, and those products are marketed as Digol, Nogol, and Goltrol. However, um, none of those products will work for grapevine crown gall. Um, there is a product, it's called Galax, and that can be used on grapes. So this is a paste, and when some of the galls are removed, the paste can be applied and can then control the bacteria at, at that location. However, it doesn't have any effect on bacteria that are located in other parts of the plants, like we've seen, like it doesn't target the roots or the, um, the canes or, or other places. So it's, it's on contact. So when, when we are looking to um, develop biocontrols, there are several set considerations that we have to um, take care of. So number one, any biocontrol strain needs to be culturable. So that means that we need to be able to grow it in the lab in order to work with it, to test it, and to develop a product. Um, in one gram of soil, there are about um, there are a billion microorganisms, but only 1% of those are actually culturable. So this it, um, has big implications um, for us uh, in our research. Biocontrols also need to grow in the plant environment. So depending on the application um, of the product, the biocontrol needs to grow in xylem, where there is a different pH compared to the soil maybe, or sometimes products are developed for root dips, then the biocontrol would have to be able to grow on the root. Biocontrols also need to grow in any local environment. So if I'm isolating bacteria from the Arctic, they may not grow in the uh, conditions that we have here in the Okanagan, for example. So many people have been um, trying to, to find and study biocontrols, and there are two very promising um, strains. One is F25 that was developed by Dr. Tom Burr. And then there is ARC1 that was developed by Dr. Akira Kawaguchi. And we've been in contact with both of those researchers and obtained permission to, to um, receive their strains. And we're planning to do more work with those strains in the, the next round of projects. Nonetheless, we were still um, trying to identify our own biocontrols. And we did that by visiting vineyards and looking for escaped vines. So escaped vines are vines that are disease free, but are otherwise located in a vineyard that shows disease symptoms. So soil containing root was sampled and as the roots were then washed in a solution and this solution was plated on, uh, on the plates here. And each of those dots is a colony of different bacteria that we can then um, isolate. And with that method, we isolated about 272 bacteria from the rhizosphere. We then used those uh, roots, surface sterilized them and ground them up, plated again, and isolated about 200 endophytes. So endophytes would be the um, organisms that grow within the plant. So in total, we've um, isolated about 472 potential biocontrols. Those were all tested on um, plate assays as shown here. So the middle line in black is where we plated the biocontrols. And then the red lines on the side is where we plated um, avitis. So if the biocontrol was effective, there was less growth of avitis on the side. 
So this two photos show some of the plate assays. The left one shows very weak inhibition of the biocontrol strain. So in the middle, we can still see the biocontrol strain growing, but avitis still grows on the side. So there is only a little bit of inhibition. Compared to the picture on the right, there is biocontrol strain growing in the middle, but absolutely no avitis growing on the side. So this is a good candidate for, for biocontrol. Um, we have reduced the big uh, number of biocontrols by plating on different media, using different avitis isolates that we isolate locally here, change the plating order, and we were able to reduce our collection to five uh, strains that have been working very well, and those are the strains that are listed here in the table. Those strains were then inoculated in, uh, into the grapevines in the greenhouse. Um, however, when we inoculated the biocontrol strains and avitis at the same time into the uh, canes, we did not see a reduction in goal formation. We are currently trying out a root dip assay where we are dipping the roots of the plants in the biocontrol solution and then planting in soil that is infected with avitis. But this is still ongoing, so we don't have a lot of um, results yet here. In addition to the bacterial biocontrols that are shown here, uh, we also looked at some fungal biocontrols and mainly trichoderma. And to date, we've identified two um, trichoderma strains that worked very well on plates, and we are also um, using those right now in greenhouse assays. So now towards my uh, fifth objective, which was looking at how compost treatments can affect crown gall in a commercial vineyard. There has been a lot of interest in compost as a sustainable management technique and compost uh, benefits of compost are known because benef um, compost improves uh, soil, it enhances nutrients uh, and organic matter, it can increase water holding capacity and it stabilizes soil aggregates. It has also shown that um, it yields, uh, higher yields can be achieved and the crop uh, can be better. Um, importantly also is that it has been shown to suppress a lot of soil borne diseases and that's mostly true for, for fungal diseases. In an earlier experiment we found that compost um, suppressed nematodes in a cherry orchard here in the Okanagan and that's important because um, there was a study that showed that avitis root infection increased by nematodes. So nematodes feed on the uh, roots and these wounds caused by the nematodes can then be entry wounds for the bacteria. So if we were able to reduce the nematode population by the addition of compost, we could reduce the nematode, uh, the, the wounding on the um, grapevine roots and have less bacteria um, infect grapevines. So uh, we, are work we are working in a commercial vineyard. Uh, it's a Chardonnay and it was established in 2014. It's located in East Kelowna and it was infected with crown gall. And we've applied compost uh, every year in spring and we are now in our fourth year. So in a couple of weeks, we're gonna be applying our last um, application. And we've used three different composts. The first one is Glengrow that was donated by the city of Kelowna and that's mostly composed of yard waste. So green clippings, grass. And the second one was Western compost that was donated by Superior Peat out of Penticton. Um, that has yard waste, but also a peat component. And then the third uh, compost was commercial winery compost. And that's mostly um, composed of agricultural waste. So over the years, we have looked at um, a lot of different parameters, the first one being plant performance. So we, we looked at all the grapevine phenology measurements. We assessed leaf greenness as a measure of leaf nitrogen content. We looked at harvest yield and cluster counts, determined pruning weight uh, in winter. Then at harvest, we also sampled berries and analyzed them for uh, bricks, TA, pH, and berry weight. And then we analyzed the soil to see if compost changed any of the soil properties. And we especially, specifically, we looked at carbon and nitrogen, organic matter, pH, and micronutrients. And then most importantly, we did look at disease severity. So we rated the percent um, of trunks that were affected by galls. And we also looked at the avitis abundance in soil by using the DDPCR methodology. 
Um, then this was a collaboration with Dr. Tom Forge, and he has been studying the nematode population in response to the compost applications. So these are the results. Um, soil carbon, soil nitrogen, and soil organic matter have increased in all of the three compost applications compared to the control. And this is a known benefit um, of, of compost, that compost can increase soil quality, um, helps regulate nutrient supply, and can change microbial activity. And that's mostly based on the increase in um, soil organic matter. Um, but also when we looked at the berries, there were changes, but only in the compost from the commercial wineries. So berry TA and berry weight increased. Um, that's not necessarily something positive, but that depends on the individual goals of the winery for, for that specific vineyard. Unfortunately, there was no change after compost application when we looked at the percentage of the galls on the trunk. Uh, and neither was it there a change in the Evite soil population. However, uh, ring nematodes increased under compost, and this is opposite to our hypothesis. Um, but pin nematodes and dagger nematodes increased um, under compost. So the compost experiment is still ongoing. We still have another year of, of research to do, and we are hoping that we have a more accurate um, picture when we look at the data um, this time next year when we've done with all of the experiments. So as a summary, it is uh, um, avitis is likely present in most uh, nursing material, and that's why it's difficult to um, establish a certification program. Biocontrol does work, and I think, as in my opinion, that would be our way out of um, Crown Gall, identifying a, a biocontrol that works here. Um, compost, however, did not produce avitis, but it did have positive effects on soil health. Um, and compost also reduced some of the po uh, nematode populations. So I'd like to thank everybody who was involved in the project, so mainly our um, sponsors and funders. And then Portia McGonigal, she's our PhD student and she has done a lot of the work. And Portia is also going to look for a postdoc in about a year or one and a half. So if you have any projects, then um, Portia would be a good person. I'd also like to thank um, Louise Nelson, so our lab at uh, UBCO, and then personnel from Cradlesgate Winery, Chad Douglas, Tim Persons, Judy Wombon, Jordi Guthrie, and then uh, Summerland Research and Development um, people who helped us. That includes Tom Forge, Paige Monroe, Jose, Karl Bogdanov, and then I'd also like to thank Wendy McFadden Smith and Jim Wilworth, who helped with uh, um, sampling for the biocontrols in Ontario, and then Lynn Bremer, who did uh, grape analysis for us. So that was it from my part. Perfect. Thank you very much, Tanya. I appreciate that. It's, uh... Very informative, certainly. I've learned a lot uh, at all these sessions, and I feel like today was no exception. Um, so we do have time now. I know we uh, approached 2.30, which was the time we had listed for the webinar to end, but um, certainly we have time to, to do a Q&A session for anybody attending who uh, wishes to remain. Um, so I'll start. A few of the questions that were typed uh, have already received typed answers, but I will uh, just read them out quickly uh, and then we can get to the questions that haven't been answered yet. Um, so one question that was received was, how big are the vines when they are planted into the field? This is in relation to the, uh, the tissue culture material. Uh, and Rob noted that uh, they will be the same as a standard bare root vine. Uh, an additional question, are the cryo-treated vines tested to confirm that they are virus free? Rob says, yes, after the University of Guelph set up the protocols, they are retested uh, by the Covey lab at Brock University. Um, another question we had, how large, sorry, I know this is just awkward watching me answer the questions as well, but we'll get to the unanswered ones momentarily. Uh, how large are the apple plants? For example, how tall when the apple trees are micrografted and how high is the graft union above the ground? This is in, uh, in relation to Rob's uh, talk on tissue culture for the apples. Uh, they are grafted at 20 to 25 centimeters high with a three millimeter diameter. Uh, Rob, if you feel the need to elaborate on any of those, uh, by all means, go ahead, but it seems like you answered them quite well typed. Uh, so I will move on to the unanswered questions here. Um, 
So the first one, and I'll open it up to uh, either Robin or Rob, uh, or both if you'd like, does cryo treatment also work for other quarantine diseases and insects? Um, I can, not necessarily. I mean, the, the work we are doing is targeting viruses. Um, in terms of other potential pathogens, you know, I'm not sure. Um, we do surface sterilize our material. So, I mean, there are some, there are some, you know, fungal um, uh, species that may be eliminated that way. But in terms of um, systemic pathogens, um, cryotreatment does not necessarily eliminate those. I would, I would assume so in, into some circumstances, but that's why we use the word vi um, virus index because we can turn around and test them for the virus we're looking for, but there are viruses that could remain. When, you know, there's viruses we just don't test for, so we can't answer the question and say, yes, they're virus-free or completely index-free or completely uh, pest-free. But um, as Robin said, we do treat the plants, you know, for pests and sterilize the, uh, the outside of the tree before we put them into um, the protocols. All right, perfect, all right. Thank you both. Um... Okay, I think we've got a couple questions now uh, for Judith and or Tanya. Um, are FPS vines free of agrobacterium? I will try to answer that one since I'm in California. Um, so FPS, the Foundation Plant Services at UC Davis, um, they have what's called the protocol 2010, which is a list of pathogens, um, mainly viruses and bacteria they test for. Um, agrobacterium is tested, um, as well as Xylella fastidiosa as, as bacteria. Uh, but unfortunately, because of the testing, um, it's not 100%. We couldn't probably trust 100% the testing that's being done. I would probably say that, and not just me, but I think even the director, ex-director, Deborah Galina, has claimed that they would not um, certify that they're free of agrobacterium. So they are tested. The testing was done um, at, at some point. We're done by a method that was developed at Tom Burr's laboratory at Cornell University. But um, because there is um, so many different strains of agrobacterium that are non-pathogenic and then there are pathogenic strains of agrobacterium. I think the methods, and, and I think Tanya can probably elaborate on that as well, um, the methods are not totally developed, specifically also because of the uneven distribution in the vines and so forth. Um, I think it's probably um, safer to say that although they've been tested, and they probably will not be propagating something that they knowingly know is infected. Um, it's best to say that they're not certified. That's, that's so the answer is probably no, they're not free. The problem may also be that um, A vitus can enter into the plants after. So there are many, um, like in the nursery process, for example, then cyan and uh, uh, rootstock needs to be free. Like there, there may be like in the water baths or the callousing baths, there may be areas where A vitus can be introduced or the, the mother blocks even with the, the soil. So everything yes, and, needs to be crowd and, fur and further CDFA, which is yeah. because FPS actually does the protocol 2010 test testing at their um, foundation blocks, but then CDFA does not test for agrobacterium. And CDFA, CDFA is the agency that actually certifies the lines in California. So again, there's FPS, University of California, and there's the California Department of Food and Agriculture, which is CDFA which certifies the vines. So um, again, going back to what Tanya is saying, even if FBS were to certify them free of agrobacterium, um, CDFA does not, which is the regulatory agency. Right, right, that makes sense, yeah, thank you. Uh, another good question here. 
either of you are welcome to, uh, to respond to this one or both. Can you test soil for avitis pre-planting? How many samples would you need to have a somewhat reliable result? Yes. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> you can answer the second pass if you want. <laughs> um, yeah, you can test soil for avitis. Um, that would only make sense though if there were grapes there previously. If it's a new vineyard, there is likely no avitis in there because it's the bacteria are associated with grapevines. So if you're replacing a vineyard and you want to know what's the level of infection in the soil, yes, we can we can run the DDPCR assay on soil um, as well. And maybe Judy can talk about how many samples you would yeah, need. So, so I'm most familiar with um, in the test, the soil sort of testing that I've been doing is um, with a company called Biome Makers. Um, and they actually do, um, I would probably say it's almost like a laundry list of everything that's found fungal and bacterial, but, um, but it will say only agrobacterium species. So I think that if if the list would actually say that there's agrobacterium species in the sample, then it would have to go to a laboratory to be, to specifically be able to detect the agrobacterium vitis. But uh, the sample is, um, you actually do three um, samples per um, hectare. Uh, so distributed again, you know, like um, distanced, um, do three little, um, but it's basically goes into a little tube. So they're little scoops. The company actually sends you a tube that has a little scoop. Um, and you can actually just scoop soil from three different locations in one he hectare. And, um, and so depending on how big your vineyard is or, or, your, or, or the, the site where you're planning on planting your vineyard, um, you will actually multiply it depending on the number, the, how big your um, vineyard is. But again, it would be the first step of the testing. So again, I don't know um, any other way of um, testing um, sampling, I guess. I wouldn't be applying the same sampling that we do with plants. Perfect, thank you both. Uh, just one final question here. And if anybody who is uh, watching, if you have any final questions, go ahead and get them in now. Um, but last question that's written in here uh, at the moment, um, I assume again, uh, either Tanya or Judith, uh, it's primarily meant for you. Uh, how long should I wait with replanting with new vines? I'm assuming if this is after vines have been removed uh, due to crown gall infection. Very I difficult question. <laughs> uh, I don't know if, if um, fumigation would actually help um, but I guess once it's in the soil, I think it would be very difficult to remove. Um, Tanya, I guess if you want to give it a... Yeah, so there has been a study um, <clears throat> from Tom Burr, and he was testing how long they, he could find um, viable avitis in the soil. And they found that bacteria were there um, after, still after two years in, in like the decaying roots. And they stopped the um, experiment because there weren't no roots anymore. So there's a possibility that there are, that it's a longer time frame that you would need to wait. But that's uh, something that um, we actually wanting to address and uh, in the new project because I think this is a very important uh, um, question that we would need to get answered. So for now, at least two years. <laughs> probably more than that. Yeah, yes. probably more. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Uh, there was actually one more question that I missed uh, and it is for Dr. Brown. Uh, it has been widely accepted that combination of heat therapy and meristem tip tissue culture could eliminate most viral infections in grapevines. What is your take on the advantage of cryotherapy over those other two options? Uh, potentially greater throughput. Um, it's a simpler technique. It's easier to, to dissect shoe tips compared to meristem tips. So technically it's more feasible to do large samples that way. Plus the cryotherapy could be coupled with cryopreservation as a routine uh, storage of clean planting stock material. Um, the thermotherapy meristem culture is, is rather a time consuming process, but I would suggest that the, the two could be complementary, but the cryo, cryopreser, cryotherapy could be added to the arsenal, to the tool set um, 
in terms of you know a virus elimination strategy. It's nothing to say that the two can't work together for more stubborn viruses, that is. Perfect. Thank you very much uh, to all the panelists for participating in the Q&A. Uh, I just have a brief remaining end presentation before we, uh, before we send off here. Uh, so once again, I just want to give special thanks to our four guest speakers here today. Uh, Robin, Rob, Tanya, Judith, thank you so much for, for joining us and providing your expertise. Uh, I know this was a webinar that a lot of people were really looking forward to. Uh, and especially since we covered so much material in, in such a short period of time, thank you for, um, you know, being thorough, but, uh, but very concise in your, uh, in your explanations. And uh, thank you as well to, for uh, answering the questions that we received. Uh, if anyone watching here is uh, enjoying the webinar series so far, that's great because we still have plenty more coming down the pipeline. You can see the list right here. Uh, primarily, the remaining webinars we have for 2022 are focused on uh, cluster research updates for the Grape and Wine Science Cluster that we administer. Uh, so upcoming on April 7th, we have uh, the Management of Virus Diseases theme. Uh, April 28th, we'll host the Sustainable Management of Soil, Water, and Crop Quality. June 9th, we'll see Crop Protection and Monitoring. And June 23rd, we'll go over optimizing the quality of Canadian wines. Uh, and the one other non-cluster webinar that we'll be hosting is on May 26th, and that one will be focused on Pinot Gris virus and Syrah decline. Um, so if you are interested in attending any of those, make sure to follow us on Facebook or Twitter, uh, subscribe to our newsletter, which you can do through our website, uh, and check the website, the events page, to see things as they uh, become available. Registration links will, will pop up usually about two or three weeks in advance of event time. Um, just a reminder as well, the webinar session today was recorded, um, so if either you want to revisit this in the future or you want to send the link to somebody who was unable to attend today, uh, the, the webinar recording will be posted on our website and on our YouTube channel probably tomorrow or at the latest by Monday, um, and that'll be circulated to everybody who attended today in a follow-up email, so you'll be able to, uh, to access it if you'd like to. Uh, lastly, when you exit the webinar here today in just a second, you'll be asked to complete a brief survey where you can share your thoughts on the session today. Uh, we'd certainly appreciate it if you could take a moment to fill that out just to help us improve the offerings for our future webinars. Uh, so that's all we have for you today. Thank you so much for attending our session. Uh, if there are any follow-up questions or anything, feel free to reach out to myself or any of our panelists or very friendly people and uh, very knowledgeable. So certainly if you had a question that wasn't addressed at the Q&A, uh, feel free to, uh, to reach out to them or to myself. Uh, thanks once again to our panelists. It was a pleasure to, uh, to meet you all and to hear you speak today. Uh, and thanks to everyone for attending. Hopefully we'll see you at the, the future webinar sessions. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thank you very much.